Good afternoon, everyone. Just waiting for everyone's uh, everyone to come through from the waiting room. It's lovely to see you all on a on a relatively sunny Friday afternoon. Uh, right, while we're just kind of waiting for, for the last sort of few people to tick through, um, if you would like to um, make sure that you are named something sensible on your Zoom name, I've given people the ability to change it. Um, I think someone's called Panda with quite a lot of exclamation marks. So if we can see where, what your name is and if you really want to, you can put which council you're from as well. Um, and what we'll what we'll do is um, we'll ask if everyone can kind of stay muted while the speakers are speaking. And uh, we're going to have two kind of Q and A sessions: one after uh, our first speaker, and one kind of towards the end that's going to kind of try and wrap up everything. So if you've got any particular questions you want to ask, we've got the chat function going on the meeting and. The lovely Rachel from Paz is also joining me to kind of help field some of those questions. Right, there we go. I think that is everybody in the room. So hello, good afternoon and welcome to this Paz event on uh, effective decision making whilst in presumption. This is something that um, I know I've been wanting to do for a long time because having worked at an authority that's been in presumption and kind of understanding the dynamics and survival techniques needed. It's felt like it's becoming a, a kind of more and more prevalent issue. Um, and so we thought it'd be really handy to kind of have this discussion about how it all links together. So for those of you who don't know me, hello, my name is Shelley Rouse. Um, I work at PAS. Um, up until uh, last year, I was working for a local authority in a local plans team. And before that, I've also worked in development management. So I've got a very strong kind of council background. Um, I, as I said, I'm joined today by uh, the lovely Rachel, who some of you may know from our return to planning um, work that's been going on. I'm also joined this morning, by, uh, this afternoon rather, uh, by uh, Jonathan Easton from King's Chambers, who is here to talk to us a, a bit about the sort of legal perspective, and Jeremy Potter from the Essex Planning Officers uh, Association. And we're also going to hear from Emma, who's going to dial in later from Braintree. So some really different and unique perspectives on, uh, on how to survive presumption. So um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're going to try and turn our cameras off uh, when the different various speakers are, are sort of doing their presentations. And then there'll be an opportunity during the Q&A to turn cameras on. Uh, and uh, obviously, we'll, we'll kind of field things from in the chat as well. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, PAS, we are part of the Local Government Association, but we are funded um, by MHCLG. So we work for government, but we aren't government. So we can sometimes uh, be a bit cheeky and, uh, and push back a little bit on things we don't quite agree with. But we, we essentially are, are here to help councils. Um, and that's our, our sort of primary role. So um, in terms of an agenda, I'm just going to quickly share a few slides and we're going to go through a little bit of an overview and, uh, and dip our toes into the world of presumption. Okay, so uh, let me let me know when you can see my slides. There's some nods, some thumbs up. Excellent. So uh, why we're we here today and what are we going to try and cover? Well, I'm going to cover a kind of first bit. So um, presumption, kind of what is it? And it's the fallout and consequences of a number of things, the housing delivery test, local housing need and old, well, out of date plans. Uh, we're then going to move on to the kind of meat of the discussion today, which is how to be dealing with presumption, uh, making effective decisions. And we're going to hear three perspectives from our from our speakers. And then I'm going to finish up with a kind of, well, how do you use that to um, 
wrap it all up into what makes a uh, good housing delivery action plan for those of you who might have to do one. And then we've got a kind of big space at the end of the day for some nice discussions and juicy questions. As you can see from the agenda, we're going to have a little coffee break at some point sneaked in this afternoon so that we can all kind of mull over what we've heard and uh, grab a cup of tea. So I'm going to start a little bit of an overview on the housing delivery test, which is something I've been working on for the last couple of years. And that's certainly what's kind of triggered my interest in helping councils think about what to do when they're in presumption. So very basically, uh, the housing delivery test is a crude sum of how many homes have been delivered uh, over a course of three years versus the total number of homes required over the three year period. And it's the homes required bit that's the killer. So for this year's publication, which uh, got published in January, it's the 2020 um, housing delivery test. Um, year one of the three year period is a population household household growth but years two and three you can either be being judged against a figure that's in your plan or uh, if it's over five years old your local housing need which is also known as the standard method also sometimes referred to as the mutant algorithm as well um, and that essentially uh, can be very different to what housing requirement you may have within your plan so for next year, so for the 2020 results, which will get published hopefully around November time, um, the full HDT period, so years one to three, um, could all be based on an area's local housing need, which could be very significantly higher or significantly lower than what's within a area's plan. So the housing delivery test kind of is part of a bigger picture. So it looks backwards over the last three years in terms of what actual deliveries happened. And you've got your five year land supply looking forward over what's anticipated to happen in the next five years. And both of these functions of looking backwards and looking forwards can land you in presumption. So this was the results. Uh, oh no, I've jumped. There we go. This was the results that happened uh, in, in January. So that got published. So 55 authorities uh, up and down England delivered below 75% and are automatically triggered into the presumption of sustainable development for a period of 12 months. We then had another 18 authorities who have um, had it to add a 20% buffer to their five-year housing land supply position. 33 authorities need to do an action plan and 203 authorities um, didn't have any consequence. So what does that really mean? Well, of the 55 councils that uh, scored under 75%, 40 of them, uh, 40 of them don't have an up-to-date plan in place. So there's a pretty strong correlation going on between what's happening with housing delivery test and what's happening with plan making. Of the 18 that need to produce a 20% buffer, we don't know um, how many of those that now tips into presumption. There may be places where they were able to demonstrate a you know, nice nine year supply. So having an increase in buffer has not made much of a difference. But for a lot of places, that addition of going from 5% to 20% may well have made, they can no longer demonstrate a five year housing land supply. And so, this is a particularly interesting um, little thing I found, which which means I think we're going to see things get worse before they get better. Of the councils that had a housing delivery test result, um, 13 councils had a blend of being judged against their plan figure and LHN. So that's where their plan became five years out of date uh, within the last three years. 67 councils were judged against their adopted plan requirement figure and 220 councils are being judged through the housing delivery test on their local housing need figure and not their plan figure. Now that might be because their local housing need figure is lower than their plan figure or it might mean that their plan is, is not in place. But I think the message here is that if we councils are being judged on their delivery for a figure that's being set by a standard method, 
there's a significant potential and risk for more and more authorities to require dealing with being in presumption. So in terms of local housing need, kind of how did we get here? Um, I don't know if anybody else remembers, but I sometimes yearn for the good old days of OAN and uh, working out five-year trend migrations, 10-year trend migrations, and all the different variables you could have a discussion about around the table. Um, anyway, we are where we are. Uh, local housing need was kind of first set out in the 2017 white paper. And it's, it's very much a kind of calculation. It's based on population um, average household growth, um, plus an affordability ratio added in. And it's kind of maths upon maths. Um, we did have some big changes potentially being consulted on last year in terms of how that calculation was put together. Um, but it's, uh, how do I say this? It, was a, it wasn't a U-turn. Um, we've definitely reverted that back to what is now standard method mark two, which for the majority of places was kind of no change, um, but for a 35% uplift on the 20 biggest urban centres and cities. So I'm going to kind of skip over this bit. There we go. So this has led to us at PAS thinking about how, how all these things kind of interplay. And uh, we've come up with what we have termed the vortex of presumption. So it's all the different dynamics that are kind of going on uh, around a council and uh, that kind of swirling, circling of the drain um, that could tip you into it. So you've got your kind of housing delivery test result going on over here and what's happening with that. You've got a kind of weather eye on where your plan is uh, and whether you're becoming out of date. And then you've got your ability to demonstrate a five year housing land supply. And all of those things are kind of in the balance and all of those things can end up with you having to uh, having to face being in presumption and what your effective decision making is going to be. So. What is the presumption? Well, it's a bit of the MPPF here, paragraph 11. It's got some lovely footnotes that go along with it as well. And uh, I'm, we're gonna hear um, much more detail about this from, from our speakers. But I suppose that the kind of, the key things to take away is it essentially means that you kind of default some of your decision-making to the MPPF. And that doesn't necessarily mean saying yes to everything. So, as we've talked about, there are the kind of three different ways that you can kind of end up in presumption. And being in presumption through failure of the housing delivery test is the sort of newest part of the puzzle. Um, and it's kind of raising the questions, well, well, how is that different from being in presumption through the other two routes? How is it different from having an out-of-date plan? How is it different from, from having a, an inability to demonstrate a five-year housing land supply? And I think the honest answer is we don't really know yet, other than it lasts 12 months long. So if you are in presumption via housing delivery test, you are stuck in it until the next housing delivery test results get published, which is unlike housing land supply, where you can take into account things that have happened. And as soon as you're able to demonstrate a land supply, kind of re republish and get yourself out of presumption. So I think we need to, to think about some key things here. We, we don't really know how planning inspector are going to behave in terms of decision making when it's just presumption via HDT. So if a council's had a poor delivery result, but they've got an up to date plan and they're able to demonstrate a five year housing land supply, we don't really know how kind of appellants are going to behave at this stage. Uh, and we don't really know how, how members are going to kind of consistently across the country behave either. So that's a bit of a whistle stop tour from me on what the kind of overview is about the vortex of presumption and the three different ways that you can land yourself into this territory. Um, but today's not really about listening to me waffle on. It's about hearing the perspectives from our three excellent speakers on uh, what are the effective tools, processes, what are the tangible things councils can do um, when they're in this territory. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over uh, to the uh, rather lovely Jonathan Easton from King's Chambers, who is joining us today.
Good afternoon, everyone. Now, hopefully, um, can I get a thumbs up or a nod to see if you can see my screen? Fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you for that introduction, Shelley. I, I suspect you and I are sharing a bit of lockdown itis because I, like you, I'm nostalgic from time to time for those many days that we've probably lost talking about economic activity rates and unattributable population change, uh, the good old OAN days. Um, but I, I, I do put that down to, to lockdown itis. I'm Jonathan Easton. I'm a, a barrister currently practising from Lancaster in my office, uh, but I'm in King's Chambers. We've got um, a fairly national reach, although we've got offices in Manchester, Leeds and Birmingham. In fact, an awful lot of my work over the last four or five years has been in the South East. Um, I have a, I must admit, and I can probably hear the boos as I say this, majority of my work, housing work, is for developers albeit that I, I retain quite a few local authority clients who've been extremely loyal to me over the years, and hopefully I'm in, I am in return. Um, can I just do, start off with a, an addition with a couple of T's and C's? The first one is that whatever I'm saying is my own view, it's not legal advice. The second one is, and I have to do this no matter where I'm appearing, whether it's, the local, whether it's a, a planning inquiry held virtually, whether it's the High Court or the Supreme Court, I always have to start off with an apology uh, because at some point during my presentation, my dog will inevitably bark. I see that as, as a, she's a very supportive dog and she normally barks at the point when I'm speaking, which I take that she agrees with everything I say and wants to support me in whatever I'm saying. So I'm gonna give um, a few legal pointers about the approach to the tilted balance. And I'll leave you to make your own mind up, uh, which is the elephant and which is the mouse. Is the mouse a set of local policies or is it the elephant that's a set of local policies? Is it the mouse that's the housing land supply? Was it the elephant? Um, the, the tilted balance, and I have to say this is, uh, on a few occasions, High Court and Court of Appeal judges have been rather unkind about that phrase. It's a planner. It's a planner made piece of jargon. It doesn't appear anywhere in the framework. Uh, but it's just a useful shorthand for explaining what happens when you're in the presumption. And the presumption means a number of different things, but broadly speaking, as I'm sure everyone understands, that there is, if you are in the presumption, unless you can switch it off, and I'll come on to that in due course, that the presumption is that planning permission is granted unless the adverse impacts significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits. So that's in really shorthand, but we need to dive into the detail to understand exactly what that's about. So, I mean, paragraph 11, Shelley's already um, shown us paragraph 11. Um, we'll, we'll look in particular at paragraph 11D, but what's overlooked from time to time is paragraph 11C, which indicates from a policy perspective that where planning applications are, comply with the development plan that is up to date, they should be granted planning permission without delay. Um, most local authorities heed that advice, but the implication of that is that that particular piece of policy supports and emphasizes the fact that there is a plan-led system, particularly where it's up to date. So um, the, the flip side of that is if the, you are promoting a scheme that is not in accordance with an up-to-date development plan, then you should find it an awful lot harder to get planning permission. And I've said, don't forget the footnotes. There are lots of footnotes. There are more footnotes in the 2019 version of the National Planning Policy Framework than there were in the predecessor, the 2012 version. Um, and some of them extremely significant. Whether that was a deliberate choice or not, I don't know. But paragraph uh, footnotes six and seven, which we'll come on to, in a moment are particularly significant when it comes to triggering the tilted balance or the presumption. So there are a number of routes to the tilted balance. People use terminology like triggers or gateways. Um, for the purpose of today, I'm using the expression trigger. The first trigger is where there are no relevant development plan policies. And this particular issue was examined most recently by the Court of Appeal in the judgment of Paul Newman Holmes Limited, which when I first read it, I thought, um, I knew Paul Newman made really nice pasta sauces. I didn't realise that he also built homes. 
Um, so what I've done is rather than share a picture of a Paul Newman home, I've shown you a photograph of Paul Newman at home back in the late, late 50s um, with his wife, Joanne Woodward. I couldn't find out the name of the dog, but they were married, Joanne and Paul were married for 50 years, which, uh, you know, in Hollywood terms is, is quite unusual, I think. So Paul Newman Holmes considered the circumstances in which there might be no relevant development plan policies. And for reasons that I think will become clear, it's quite rare that the tilted balance is triggered because of there being no relevant development plan policies. And the reasons for that are as follows. So the court held that a relevant policy for those purposes must have a real role to play in the determination of the application. So it can't be a situation, for example, where you don't have a relevant development plan policy in re relation to the number of bins that you have on a housing estate. Um, it has to be something that really has an impact. Yeah, a relevant policy doesn't have to be and is very unlikely to be determinative of the outcome of the planning application. And a really important point the Court of Appeal made was that it, the, the, policy, the, the policy that you're looking for doesn't have to be specific to the particular proposal that you are promoting. So it could be, and in the vast majority of cases, I can't think of any that don't have the, these sort of policies, that a traditional set of development management policies are almost always going to be relevant to a particular proposal. So in most cases, it will be sufficient to identify the sort of criteria-based policy that will, you'll see in many local plans, which talk about ensuring um, no adverse impact on the character and appearance of the area, or ensuring um, proximity to accessible modes of transport, that sort of thing. So nearly every single local plan has those sort of policies. And it's perhaps for those reasons that I think it would be particularly rare that you would have a situation where a local plan had no relevant development plan policies. And a theme which is going to emerge during my talk today is that of planning judgment. The other thing the Court of Appeal held was that it's not for the courts to determine whether a particular policy is relevant or not, because the relevance ultimately is a question of planning judgment for the decision taker. At first instance, the local planning authority, if there's an appeal, the inspector. That's not to say the courts will never intervene, because if, if you've misread the policy or the, the, the judgment about its relevance is obviously irrational, the court will intervene, but in most cases it won't. So trigger two, and what, I, what I've done here is I've, I've managed, I think, seamlessly um, to use my, my digital skills uh, to, to produce a, uh, what I think is a fairly stunning graphic there, MIP. MIP, as opposed to VIP, stands for most important policies. So the second, the second trigger is where the most important policies um, for determining the application are out of date. And this is examined, so the question of this approach was examined back in 2019 in the Wavendon Properties case, and I've given a reference there, and there's a particular paragraph that if you want to look at the way in which the court said you should carry out this exercise, um, there's a really helpful summary of, of the approach to take. But what's, what's interesting to know, just by way of, of background here, is that the, the 2012 framework had a phrase along these lines that it's where relevant policies are out of date that the tilted balance would be triggered. The 2019 version talks about the most important policies. Now, um, one can read into that change what one will, but so if the, I think that the change probably focused attention on the policies most likely to make a difference to the outcome of the application or the appeal and avoided the tilted balance being triggered if, say, parking standards policies were demonstrably out of date. Um, because I certainly in my, in my 
practice on both sides, developer and local planning authority, before the most important policies um, part of the framework came into force, one would spend quite a long time trying to hunt around for policies which may be relevant, albeit even tangentially, to the decision to see whether or not they were inconsistent with the MPPF in some way, and then arguing that for that reason, relevant policies were out of date. So I think the change in the change in wording does a couple of things. It focuses attention on what policies are genuinely going to make a difference. And it also avoids um, people spending an awful long time going through every single development plan policy to see whether or not they're consistent with the framework. So the, the Wavendon Properties case established that in order to get to a point where you make a judgment, again, planning judgment is the ultimate guide here, whether the most important policies are out of date, you ask, it's really a three-stage test. So first of all, so which, which relevant policies are the most important? So the two aspects there, you have to consider which are the most relevant, which are the relevant policies, and of those relevant policies, which are the most important. You then carry out an exercise to ask yourself whether each of those relevant policies, which are also most important, are up to date or out of date. And I'll come on, come on in due course just to explain, you know, give a few pointers about how you carry out a judgment um, in order to assess whether your policies are, are up to date or out of date, but it's principally the degree to which they are consistent with up to date national policy. So having done that exercise, you ask yourself the question whether or not as a whole, your basket of, of most important policies are consistent with national policy. So by this stage, you've got, that's what you, you genuinely, I mean, it's a good way of, of looking at it. You have, you know, you have a, you have a wicker basket, could be made of any material, it doesn't really matter of policies and the ultimate judgment is weighing them all together are they as a basket of policies consistent or inconsistent with up-to-date national policy if the answer is that they're not consistent the most important policies are out of date and the balance is tilted if not the balance isn't tilted um, the other point just to note here and this is <coughs> back to the paul newman case again it may, it may be possible in some circumstances that a single policy is so important that its out of datedness might be sufficient in and of itself to tilt the planning balance in favor of uh, planning permission. That's again, probably unlikely to occur uh, on many occasions, but if you have a, a very clear and site specific policy that relates say to development requirements for an allocation, and that is going to be a determinative policy. If that, if that policy is demonstrably out of date, that might, I stress might, be sufficient to conclude that irrespective of the five-year housing land supply position, that particular policy is out of date. So it roots to the tilted planning balance. Um, I think part of the focus of today is to, is, to, is to look at what happens in circumstances where you don't have a five year supply or where the housing, the application of the housing delivery test triggers the presumption. I mean, just to be clear, that the first trigger that I've gone through can apply in circumstances where the local authority does have a five year supply. So the out of datedness point is still possible to have a five year supply but for you or inspectors to conclude that because of the inconsistency with national policy, the tilted balance should apply in any event. Um, but I'm looking here principally at, first of all, the absence of a five-year housing and supply, for which you need to look at paragraph 73 of the framework. And secondly, uh, where the housing delivery test automatically triggers the presumption. And can I just break off at this stage to give a little a little plug. Um, this doesn't work for every local authority, but I've been involved in the northwest of England. One of my most loyal local authority clients, the Fylde Borough Council, and they are only one of a handful of local authorities who have submitted and had approved 
an annual position statement. So two years running, they have had their five-year housing land supply fixed because the an, an inspector has approved their annual position statement. Now, they, they had a local plan adopted in 2018. In fact, we just had the examination in public of a partial review this week. But one thing that the annual position statement has done is to ensure that developers coming forward have not attacked the five-year housing and supply position. So the, the trajectory is something like this. So the five-year supply obviously had to be found in order for the plan to be determined to be sound by the examining inspector. But each year since the adoption of the plan, the council has submitted an APS. And that gives a, I have to say, a significant degree of protection. Um, and it's even more important, I suppose, to note that the five-year supply, I think in both cases, has been about 5.1 or 5.2 years. But even then, because you have this, almost the certification by the planning inspectorate that there is a five-year supply, um, that carries a, a fairly significant amount of weight. Doesn't work for everyone, as I said, because if you if you think that you might lose a few sites, it's probably better not to go for it rather than risk an inspector concluding that you have a 3.5 or 3.7 year supply. But it's something to think about. And you know, part of me is a little bit surprised that more local authorities haven't gone down this particular route. So um, you're in the presumption because either you can't demonstrate a five year supply or the housing delivery test has pushed you into that particular corner. Um, does that mean that you have to grant planning permission? Um, and I can answer that in two words, N and O. Because there are a number of things you need to think about. So if the presumption is would otherwise be triggered, whether your policies are out of date or there's a lack of a five-year supply, that there are there's one important circumstance in which that tilted balance can be switched off. Um, and that's where the application of policies in the framework that protect areas or assets of particular importance provides a clear reason for refusing the development proposed. And what I'm going to do is um, give a couple of examples of where it might be the case that even though you have, don't have a five-year supply and you would otherwise be in the presumption, the presumption is switched off. I'll explain the photograph in a minute. Um, so footnote six, I said footnotes were important. Footnote six refers to specific protective policies in the framework and includes obvious things like green belt, designated heritage assets, heritage coast, protected habitats, and AONB. Um, and AONB is particularly relevant because that's the photograph of Trevor, who is my trusty trolley, who has been by my side for over 10 years. Um, and he's not had an awful lot to do over the last 12 months. So I decided to let him return to the wild. Um, that is Trevor in the forest of Boland area of outstanding natural beauty. And lest anyone's concerned that I was littering, now I put him back in the car, it was just for, um, again, lockdown, I just a silly little social media thing that I was doing. Um, so those are the, in general terms, protective policies. A few examples. So first of all, designated heritage assets. I think everybody will, will know that paragraph 196 of the framework um, has a, a mini heritage planning balance so that if less than substantial harm is caused to a designated heritage asset then that particular balance can only be satisfied if the public benefits of the particular proposal outweigh that less than substantial harm now i think it's fairly easy to conclude that where that heritage balance is not satisfied a protective policy, this is going back to the wording of the footnote, a protective policy will provide a clear reason for withholding planning permission and would thereby switch off the presumption that might otherwise be switched on. So that's one example. AONB 
is another good example. And this is very recently, only about six weeks ago, been a matter that was considered by the Court of Appeal in Monk Hill against the Secretary of State. And the focus of that particular challenge what was paragraph 172 of the MPPF. And that paragraph um, requires that great weight is to be given to the conservation of the AOMB. What it doesn't say is that if there's harm to the AOMB, planning permission should be refused. What it doesn't have is a balancing exercise akin to paragraph 196. But what the Court of Appeals said was that um, if you determine having given great weight to the AONB that there was harm to the AONB, then that is sufficient to conclude that there is a clear reason for withholding planning permission. And that would be sufficient to switch off the presumption were it otherwise switched on. The important thing that not only in respect of AOMB, but also designated heritage assets, the important thing to note is that what paragraph 11 tells you to do is to apply the policy. So the fact that a site is within the AOMB or even in the green belt or in a, an area with a specific designation doesn't in and of it, doesn't automatically switch off the presumption, you have to apply the policy. So in a case of AOMB, the fact that a, a proposal is within the AOMB doesn't switch it off. You have to apply the policy and then, then come to a conclusion as to whether or not that provides a clear reason for refusing planning permission. Uh, again, that requires the application of planning judgment. So the clear reason part of paragraph 11 is unlikely to be interfered with by the courts. Another example, dead easy one, green belt. Um, I think it's, it's the unavoidable conclusion is that if very special circumstances don't exist um, in a green belt case, that would provide a clear reason for refusing planning permission and switching off the tilted balance where it otherwise switched on. Um, I say it's less tricky because it's very unlikely that you have a situation where you're where the development site is within the green belt, the very special circumstances weren't demonstrated to be shown whether presumption will make any difference whatsoever. Very special circumstances will probably lead to planning permission. Uh, but it's it's a good it's quite a neat illustration of the circumstances in which the, the application of national policy would give rise to the presumption being switched off. So you, you're in the tilted balance. It remains switched on for whatever reason. Um, You've selected your, you've got your basket of policies, um, which are represented there by a bowl of fruit. Um, what do you do then? So whether or not trigger one or trigger two applies, planning judgment must be used to reach an assessment as to the weight you attach to your existing and remaining local plan policies and so there's a, there's a few important messages just just to bear in mind and i preface this by saying that when the, the concept of the presumption of sustainable development and the tilted balance first came in in 2012 um, it very it very quickly became apparent that if you were as a developer able to demonstrate the absence of a five-year housing land supply, that was almost seen as the silver bullet that would get you planning permission. Um, things have moved on quite considerably since 2012, so that um, the lack of a five-year supply is not as determinative as it once was. Um, and I think some of the reasons for that are in this series of key messages. Um, even if you're in the tilted balance, the starting point's always going to be section 38.6 of the Planning Compulsory Purchase Act. 
yeah, there is a presumption in favour of the statutory development plan. The second point to note is that the MPPF is a material consideration, albeit an important one. It is a material consideration. So when you're asking yourself the question, um, making a decision in accordance with the de development plan, unless material considerations indicate otherwise, the consideration of the MPPF is on the other side of that particular balance. And the Supreme Court made that clear that they didn't say use the word just a material consideration, but they wanted to make the point that the MPPF it is not and cannot um, in a position to supplant the development plan. It, it can't prescribe, nor does it attempt to prescribe, the weight that you would give to individual local policies, whether or not you're in the presumption. That is a matter for the decision maker. And um, I say this with a little bit of trepidation because it's not something I'd recommend regularly. But there are circumstances where the MPPF might indicate a particular outcome. But if you as a local planning authority have good reasons and explain them as to why you are not following slavishly the outcome mandated by the MPPF, your decision can nevertheless still be a lawful one. And I've given a, um, I'm afraid, a rather self-deprecating example of where that occurs. So it was a case I was involved in for a developer that the issue uh, this was relatively shortly after the standard method came in it was a local planning authority that didn't that, that housing policies has a requirement policy was older than five years that national policy would indicate that the standard method would be the way in which you judge the housing land supply position on the standard method that particular local authority did not have a five-year supply that much was common ground but they wanted to take a different approach because they said that if you applied the standard method strictly, it didn't recognise a number of particularities or deficiencies in the ONS data that applied to their local authority area. So what they promoted was an alternative OAN, which they, they had devised, not simply for that appeal, but as part of their emerging local plan process. And if you applied that OAN figure, they did have a five-year supply. That was common ground as well. So the argument was whether it, it was a requirement that the inspector should follow national policy. If he did, there wasn't a five-year five year supply. He went with the council and explained that there were particular reasons why they didn't need to follow national policy strictly. Um, we challenged it. The High Court gave us fairly short shrift and said, the MPPF is a material consideration provided somebody has good reasons for doing something different then it's it's up to them and ultimately the, the way to attach to the national planning policy framework is a matter of planning judgment which again just contrast that outcome to the sort of outcome that one might have predicted in 2012 or 2013 so quite different So the, the next, so you've got your, you've got your policies. You bear in mind that the key messages that I think I've just um, set out, and you have to reach a judgment about how much weight you give to relevant policies. Um, again, I'll keep on stressing this. So the the weight is up to the decision maker, um, and what. It, as, as a barrister, what I've noticed is a, a trend, particularly over the last four or five years, perhaps longer, where the courts regularly express discontent about the over-legalisation of the planning process. What they're concerned about regularly are, are challenges or disagreements to planning judgments wrapped up in fancy pants lawyer language. And they are pushing back against that. And more regularly than ever before, the courts are saying um, where the decision involves the application of planning judgment, we are not interested. It is not our role as courts to get involved with planning judgment unless the um, 
the decision is so obviously irrational or so obviously misinterpreted what local or national policy has to say about an issue, we just won't get involved. So what sort of things might you take into account when deciding that the weight to be given to local policies when you're in the presumption? Um, and I must say that there's a, there's a wide variety of factors to take into account. It will depend in, on the circumstances of the case, the development you're considering, the way in which your local policies have been drawn. So I can give some sort of broad headings and a few ideas, um, which I think would apply in many cases. So the first one is to ask yourself uh, the extent to which the policies that are relevant are consistent with the framework. The closer to the framework, the greater the weight you can give them. Um, but in carrying out that exercise, what you do need to bear in mind is that local policies don't need to, to repeat verbatim the policies in the framework. If there's a difference in emphasis or a slightly different wording, then that doesn't automatically lead to the conclusion that it's inconsistent and therefore out of date. And again, the, whether the level of consistency and the level of weight that you attach uh, to local policies uh, where you're doing the comparison with the framework, matter of judgment, but needs to be explained. Um, so the, 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 the weight you would give, I don't know, for example, to development management policies is a really important exercise especially where the balance the tilted balance has been triggered because you don't have a five-year supply or the housing delivery test has failed because it may well be that you you have a a plan that was examined against the most recent framework which in all other respects is entirely consistent with the mppf um in in those circumstances particularly those policies that don't really bear on the acceptability and principle of housing development, it would be entirely legitimate to say, we had an examination three years ago, the policies in the, in, in the MPPF haven't changed fundamentally. The inspector found that our, our development management policies were entirely sound. Um, so for those reasons, we're going to give substantial or significant weight to those policies, notwithstanding the fact that we're in the tilted balance because we don't have a five year supply. Another question always to take into account is what, what impact would the strict application of these policies have on the ability to deliver housing? Because that's one of the key objectives of tilting the balance is to encourage local authorities to grant planning permission for more houses. Um, so would a rigid adherence to policies that seek to con contain development within settlement boundaries have an impact on your ability to deliver a five-year supply? Um, if the answer to that question is that probably strict application might reduce the number of houses, it would be entirely reasonable to slightly decrease the amount of weight or hugely decrease the amount of weight. Again, matter of judgment. The thing that you perhaps would like to bear in mind in those circumstances is that settlement boundary policies often are seeking to do two things seeking to identify those locations where development is acceptable in principle and directing development to sustainable locations within settlements but also the flip side of that is that those sort of policies not only direct development but they also seek to afford a level of protection to open countryside outside settlement boundaries. Now, national policy in paragraph 170 still um, requires the protection of valued landscapes. It still requires decision makers to recognize the intrinsic beauty um, and of the countryside. It doesn't mean no protection. It doesn't mean recognize, doesn't mean you just have to say, oh, that's a really pretty field and let's build on it. It does, it does denote a degree of protection. So those are the sort of things to, to, to have in mind. The, the other, I mean, a related point, and this came up in a another recent decision, appeal investments against the Secretary of State, is well, what, 
what is the policy that you're looking at? What's its, what's its role? Is it all to do with housing? Or does it have a different function? The policy in the Peel Investments case was obviously relevant to housing, but one of its other functions was to protect a green wedge between different uh, different conurbations. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is: in those circumstances, is it is it, uh, is it your judgment that protecting that green wedge from encroachment? has an important policy, national policy consistent objective, or is it just about housing? So if, if one of the most important aspects of that policy is, is to protect valued open land, again, you, you would be well within your rights to conclude that substantial weight should still be attached to that particular policy. Um, it's always worthwhile pointing out when you're in the presumption and this 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 applies sort of less to the weighting of policies but more to the question of what sort of weight can you attach to um housing in circumstances where you have a shortfall and i think it's always worth remembering that as local planning authorities, unless you have your own housing company, or unless you are plowing loads of money into delivering your own council houses, that you your role um, is to grant planning permissions. It's the market that delivers. So what's always worth looking at and explaining, whether in an officer's report, when you get to appeal to the inspector, well, what what is the level of the housing shortfall? Yeah, is if it's at 4.9 years, then the presumption will automatically be triggered because that's a binary question. Weight is a matter of judgment. But one of the things that you might like, like to take into account in affording weight to local policies that affect housing is we're at 4.9. Yeah, our our development plan, our spatial strategy, the way in which we should distribute housing is working pretty well. Yeah, we've fallen short, we accept that, we accept we're in the presumption. Um, but in those circumstances, the, the strict application of our housing policies isn't resulting in a housing, you know, in a housing supply of say two and a half years. Yeah, we're doing okay. The other thing always to bear in mind as well is, well, if you are in the presumption because you failed the housing delivery test or you don't have a five year supply, what are you doing to make things better? You know, are you are you selling council owned land? Um, are you providing assistance to developers on sites that have stalled? Do you have an action plan? So local planning authorities who are obviously trying to do something to get out of the presumption are, are going to fare a lot better than those who just throw their hands up and say, look, we're in the presumption. It, it's a nightmare. What on earth can we do to get out of it? And as a, as a touchstone, and as a, quite a useful way of illustrating the fact that it's local planning authorities that grant permissions, it's the market that builds them, see how many planning permissions you've granted over, say, a five-year period. Um, and you know, if you carry that exercise, quite often a local authority will find, well, let's for sake of argument, your housing requirement is 500 a year you may well find that you're granting 750 planning permissions a year, but you're only, yeah, only 450 are being delivered. It's an important message, I think, sometimes to put across that insofar as local authorities are able to influence housing delivery, it's through granting planning permissions. If you're keeping your side of the bargain by, by granting more than sufficient permissions to meet your housing requirement, that's a powerful indicator that as a local authority, you're doing as much as you can. The, the riposte often from developers is, well, you might be granting lots of permissions, but on an outline, you're running really slow. You're not, you're not, you're not approving reserve matters in sufficient time, or on full applications, you're taking ages to determine. That again, yeah, just as a as a, a way of understanding whether it's the market or local authority decision making that is holding things up, it might be worth just worthwhile having an eye to how quick your turnaround times are. 
so that if a developer does come back and say, you know, we've got all these permissions, but we're, you're not signing off our conditions, you're not approving our reserve matters. So I'm going to leave you with a, what I hope will be some positive messages. It's it's not nice being the presumption. I completely accept that. And when I'm acting for local authorities that are in the presumption, it, it's, a, it's a tougher task resisting development and appeal than it is where they're not. But some key messages. Um, Section 38.6 is always the starting point. If there's conflict with the development plan, that sets up a statutory presumption against the grant of planning permission. The framework does not and is not intended to replace development plan policies. Even if you're in the world of the tilted balance, um, it's for local authorities and then subsequently an inspector on appeal to determine the weight to be attached to those policies. That requires the exercise of planning judgment, which as I've said, the courts really don't want to get it in, uh, involved with. And the one thing I'd, I'd say it's almost as important as putting paragraph numbers in officers' reports and paginating them. Show your workings in your officers' report. If you're in a position where you're having to make decisions about weight to policies in the tilted balance world, explain how you've reached that judgment because if you set out your rationale and your reasoning for why you're giving substantial weight to a particular policy even though you're in the tilted balance that will go a very long way to persuading an inspector if there's an appeal that your planning judgment is a sensible and well-reasoned one thank you very much indeed thank you Thank you, Jonathan. That was that was that was great, and I can see from from the sort of delegates in the room, like that was full of really interesting stuff. Um, I couldn't agree more. The kind of show your workings message. Um, we've been trying to kind of say that your housing delivery test action plan is is the place where you can bring all those workings together and and paint that narrative. And that's um, that's definitely the kind of uh, flavour and approach that the PAS guide on the website says for action plan so it's really good to hear that you, you, your perspective kind of echoes with that um, and I'm also pleased to hear that you love the APS process um, so we we supported um, the councils going through it last year and we ran an event uh, last week for those who are interested there's some really tight eligibility criteria for who can apply each year um, which yeah, it would be nice to kind of see it expanded because I think it does have real merit. Um, so if anyone is in the room who thinks they might be eligible because they have a recently adopted plan who wants to talk to us about doing an APS, then drop us a line. because so we've got some templates and some support to give you. Yeah, I mean, um, just on that, we just we had we had to judicially review the Secretary of State because they said that we weren't allowed to make an application for an APS unless we'd expressly asked the inspector to confirm our five-year supply at the examination. The difficulty with that was at the time we went to examination, that particular part of the PPG that said you had to ask didn't exist. Yeah. That the P now, thankfully, the PPG has now changed so that as a local, local authority, even if you don't ask, if the inspector says you've got a five-year supply and adoption, you're fine, you can apply. Yeah, it's. Um, I think there were a couple... Um... A couple who tried to apply last year who because of the time they set timings if you if you haven't adopted your plan by a certain cutoff date you can't do it you've, you've missed the boat so it's it's worth checking checking our sort of notification template we've got on our website if, if you sort of unsure um in terms of questions i can't see that anyone's put anything in the chat however i'm uh, i know that um some of our delegates sent me some questions yesterday that they would like to um, ask. And what I'm particularly interested to hear the answer is, is from um, Sarah Parker in Thanet. Um, and it's principally around footnote six um, and the, the areas that are kind of help you switch, switch the switch off. Um, and she's asking where a local authority area um, is entirely covered by the habitat regulations so that's a, a special protection area and its zone of influence 
does that have the same effect? Does that switch the presumption switch off? I mean, just that's paragraph 177 of the framework, which I'm scrolling through to find very quickly. Nearly there. There we go. So uh, for those who, who haven't memorized or don't have it in front of you, so the paragraph 177 um, says, the presumption in favor of sustainable development does not apply where the plan or project is likely to have a significant effect on the habitat site, either alone or in combination, unless an appropriate assessment is concluded that the plan or project will not adversely affect the integrity of the habitat site. So the first point to note, I think, is that that would apply to development either within an SAC or an SPA or within the zone of influence, because, of course, you could have development outside those areas which would adversely affect its integrity. But the way the way I look at that is that if the if the presumption you have to assume the presumption would otherwise apply. So you have a local authority; it doesn't have a five-year supply. Uh, there, you have to ask yourself the question: first of all, will there be a significant effect on a habitat site? Which is a question of judgment. Um, if there is, then uh, you have to carry out an appropriate assessment. If the appropriate assessment concludes that there won't be an adverse impact on the integrity of a habitat site, then the presumption is switched back on again. That's my reading of 177. And to be honest, if an appropriate assessment concluded that there was going to be an adverse impact on the integrity of a protected site, your chances of getting planning permission are pretty slim anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can see Sarah nodding on the screen, so hopefully she's, she's happy with that answer. Um, and then uh, I've also got a question from um, Ian Armstrong from Gateshead. Um, he asks, it will be useful to know what you think the effect of presumption will have on local authorities who are constrained by Greenbelt uh, and the interface between the MPPF policy of presumption and the statutory duty towards the development plan, which kind of your the second part, your, your presentation covered really nicely. But yeah i think that's an interesting thing though so for, for places that are completely constrained by greenbelt do you think having the presumption applied either through housing delivery test or five-year housing land supply i mean is it a case of it doesn't affect me so i don't care and that's really i mean greenbelt is a huge issue i mean it's something that people talk about all the time and um again my, my impression is that there are as a proportion of those local authorities who are in presumption because of the, the failure of the housing delivery test, th there are quite a few representatives who have large swathes of green belt. Um, from a from a decision making point of view, um, you obviously have to apply the national policy test to very special circumstances, which is a high bar. Mm -hmm. So th there's a real there's a, there's a real and obvious tension between the presumption, which um, requires you to tilt the balance uh, unless it's switched off, and the Greenbelt protective policies, which requires you to turn it off. Mm. Um, the, the, the answer, I suppose, the, the obvious answer to that question is um, so that you're not constantly in the presumption world, get yourself an up-to-date plan. Yes, all routes lead to good plan making, <laughs> Yeah. great we've we've had a, a question come through in the chat from martin um so um martin i'm guessing you are from ipswich yes yep <laughs> yep hi um just it was partly a comment just to see if there's anyone else on the call in the same position you can see from what i've said that we're one of the unusual um authorities that got a local plan adopted despite not having a five-year housing supply in 2017 we were asked to do an immediate review which we're just been to examination on and hopefully we will now have a five-year housing supply but really in that intervening period we haven't um, our councillors are saying to us what difference does presumption now make to us because clearly we've been up against it throughout and um and not delivering so really does it change the goalposts much at all for us is anyone else in that position Oh, gosh. Um, does that make any difference? Well, I, I suppose if, if you've been living in it for a while, then you might be 
taking on some of the kind of behaviors and processes that we're going to talk about after the coffee break um but as a general point you know presumption shouldn't be a place where you begin to feel comfortable it's not a take your slippers off you know re relax it it really is survival mode um for councils and there should be kind of a weather eye on how to get yourself um get yourself out of it um no, we understand and we certainly have been we're in terms of and i'll pick up the points that jonathan had made we certainly determine applications probably i think we're at 97 percent approval um, with 99% on time as well. And we've got over two and a half thousand houses approved, but not built, um, which doesn't help us when we're trying to achieve 400 odd per year. So we've done everything we can. So in, in real terms, it, it doesn't appear to be making a difference to us, um, but we are of course hoping to turn that around um, as a result of our new plan. But does, is, it, is it not making a difference? Because if you're, if, if, you're over, if you're approving the overwhelming majority of applications, and presumably you've, you've permitted more than enough to keep your house, if they were built, to keep your land supply ticking over, then you probably are adopting some of the behaviours that national policy suggests you should be, i.e. granting as much as you possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, in a positive way, we're doing everything we can. So yeah. we're certainly not adopting the route that it doesn't matter anymore, um, the presumption, because we're already in trouble. Yeah. Far from it. Yeah, we've, we've adopted positive behaviours before. Um, we've set up companies specifically to deliver housing. So we, there's lots of streams that we've opened up to. But this, the simple fact is, because of land values in, in Ipswich, delivery has been slow um, and very slow in the last couple of years. We've only had one year in the last four where we've, we've met our actual target. So it is difficult, but certainly in terms of appeals, we, we certainly do very well. So I, I just really wondered whether, you know, how many other councils are in the sort of position we're in, because it's quite unusual. It is, and I can see that Jeremy has been trying to come in, and he he's he's probably the ex the, 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 the most the one of us who's got most to say on this. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you, Sherry. Hi, Martin. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose it really depends whether you're being forced to grant planning permissions that are outside of your local plan, really, um, and whether. Um, you're taking those behaviours that Jonathan and Shelley were talking about or whether you're holding fast and actually um, you're not getting uh, the scale of speculative development that would enable, that is actually forcing you into a situation where the, the, the sort of presumption really starts biting. I suppose that's, that's, that's the key, I suppose. Yeah, thank you. I mean, and we're we're one of those authorities that's got such a tightly drawn boundary so even much of the housing that people locally associate with Ipswich falls outside of the actual boundary so the only real spaces we have left are our parks so our next plan is very likely to have to be a joint local plan with and, our neighbours. And that you're not alone there so there are other authorities so I'm thinking Cambridge, Harlow, there are authorities that are really are constrained in any respect, just geographically uh, by their boundaries that actually just in some ways, the presumption doesn't really bite as much as if you've got huge swathes of, I suppose, white as white land that you know, doesn't have any specific notation. That's great. Right. We're going to dash from Ipswich on one side of the country down to the other side in Somerset. Michael, you've been waiting very patiently with your question on presumption. Thank you. Yeah, and, and hello, th thanks so far. Um, in terms of, yeah, I just want to gently challenge the sort of the, 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 the term that a lot of people use, the presumption, and we've used it today. Now, that in my mind is the, is the, is the presumption in favour of sustainable development, but I don't mean to use it as a presumption in favour of granting planning permission. We've got to be a little bit careful because we've had this discussion many times at, at our appeal. If you look at paragraph 11, it's actually headed the presumption in favour of sustainable development. So sustainable presumption is about local plans and it's about decisions. Actually, if you go down through paragraph 11 to paragraph D, which is where we, we are, at that stage, it's what happens if your local plan is out of date. Not a presumption in, it's, it's not saying that that doesn't mean that local policies are no longer sustainable. It doesn't mean that substandard development is, is now acceptable. And we've been very successful in that. For example, 
Um, villages, uh, we've been arguing, because of our settlement hierarchy, they're inherently unsustainable. And they're unsustainable whether there's a policy saying they're unsustainable, but because the FPPS says, for all sorts of reasons, car use, access to facility service, they are unsustainable in those terms. So whether or not your policies are up to date, your settlement boundaries are in place, certain villages are not appropriate place to, to, to deliver development. So I have to be a little bit careful about sort of this phrase, the presumption, because local plans are a question of what sustainability means in your local area. So the local plans are presumption in favour of sustainable development. But this part of the, the process is just thinking about well, what happens if, in terms of the, the MPPF, they are out of date. Yeah, so Michael, th thanks for that. I mean, that's for that reason, I, I, I usually use the word, the expression tilted balance, not presumption, because the paragraph 11, all, all of the bits within the box in paragraph 11 are telling you how the presumption in favour of sustainable development works in practice. So, I mean, a good illustration might be paragraph 11c. So the presumption in favour of sustainable development means that you grant without delay development that accords with an up-to-date development plan. That's how the, the presumption applies in that particular case. Where you don't have a five-year supply or your policies are out of date, the way in which you apply the presumption is to trigger the tilted planning balance. So I agree. I mean, but the terminology presumption, you know, the term presumption is used an awful lot, but I think in many, many cases, it's it's used interchangeably with tilted balance, but I prefer the latter. Oh, well, I prefer my vortex. So you had roots to tilted balance. I had my vortex sort of swir swirling around the drain. Um, we've got two, two questions left in the chat. And I think probably if we deal with them and then go for a little bit of a coffee break, I, I know I'm getting ready for a cup of tea. Um, we've got a question from David, which I'm interested to hear the answer. Um, local green spaces have the kind of same level of protection as, as green belt. Do, do you think they've got the same kind of magic of turn, flicking the switch of presumption off? They, local green space is expressly mentioned as part one of the, I'm using the basket expression here, basket of protective policies in footnote six to paragraph 11. So if the application of a local green space policy provided a clear reason for refusal, then the tilted balance is switched off. That's a nice straightforward one. Um, and then a uh, uh, last one from Claire. Um, does the lack of a five-year housing land supply only make policies related to housing supply out of date if other policies are consistent with the MPPF? Can we apply full weight to other policies um, before putting them into the basket? Okay, let's just unpick that. Um, so the reason I'm looking away is not because I'm disinterested, it's because I've got a second screen to my side. So when I'm looking across, that's what I'm doing. Um, so if you don't have a five year supply, then as, as I um, you still need to reach a judgment about the weight that you attach to relevant policies. Uh, as I said, one of the things that you might like to consider is you know, whether your development management policies are all about housing. Most of the time they're not, they would apply to any form of development. So you are entitled, um, if assuming you give limited weight or reduced weight to your housing policies, you're entitled to say, are development management policies, for example, the policies that seek to protect um, landscape character areas of, of particular importance are entirely consistent with the framework and we're still gonna give substantial weight to them. The thing you do need to bear in mind is that the broad assumption where you are in the tilted balance because of the lack of a five-year housing land supply is that some, some weight reduction should apply to policies that would prevent you from achieving your five-year supply. So again, whilst it's a matter of planning judgment, the amount of weight you give, and you could in some circumstances give full weight to non-housing related policies, that has to be understood in the context of what the tilted planning balance is trying to get you to do. It's trying to get you to grant more permissions for housing so that you get to and above your five-year housing land supply requirement. 
hope that answers that question. It did for me. It did for me. Right. Um, I can see it's quarter past. So is everyone OK with a with a short 10 minute break? And if we come back here at uh, 325, um, please feel free to turn off your cameras um, and your your microphones. Um, try not to leave the meeting and I'll see you guys back here in about 10 minutes. Thanks.
Hello, Sarah. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, you are one of my um people who are eligible for an annual position statement. Oh. Did you know? I thought I might be. <laughs> I've just dropped my pen. Hang on. <laughs> oh dear. Well, if you are interested in fixing your land supply, come and come and have a chat. Yes, yeah, we were thinking about it, but then if it's going to unpick your whole five year supply, it's always a bit of a worry, isn't it? It's not so, without its risks. No, no. But um, yeah. yeah, I'll take that back and see what see what Adrian wants to do. So, thank you for asking my question. That's all right. <laughs> I will um I'll email you the um the stuff from the event Paz held on annual position statements last week. Oh yeah. We yeah, thank you. Uh, and that goes to any other delegates who might be considering it. Let me know let me know in the chat and I can send that out. Hi, Shelley. I think we'll just we'll just wait a few more minutes. I just need to to caveat uh, the next session uh, with the fact that I can hear that my children have returned from school. Um, they may well <laughs> burst in behind me with some unexpected noises and requests for food, drink, or the Nintendo. So I apologise in advance. <laughs> I was going to make exactly that same apology, Shelley, at the start of my presentation. <laughs> um, likewise, and to hungry dogs. So. Well, it, I, I should. This was meant to be in the morning, um, but uh, somebody else within the team pinched the Zoom license for this morning, so we had to uh, we had to go in the afternoon. Um, I mean, for a, for a planning geek like me, a Friday afternoon spent talking about, <laughs> about land supply. I'm, tilted balance is uh, is my idea of heaven but yes it's maybe not for everyone <laughs> no I, I hear you Shelley but that's nothing on um, I was doing an examination in public this week and one of the representors had to apologize he had a very lengthy piece and all you could hear was screaming in the background and his five-year-old daughter had come back from school and didn't like a shoe rack that they bought for the for the hallway so she had a half an hour tantrum about it oh children are fickle aren't they fickle <laughs> right i it feels like everyone might be back i've got myself a cup of tea to get through the distraction of children um jeremy i am really looking forward to hearing your perspective on some of the kind of 
techniques uh, and things you can do when uh, trying to survive or, or being in that survival mode. So um, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to do a bit of a bit of a Chris Whitty double act of next slide, please. So whenever you're ready, Jeremy, let me know. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. So if you could just if you could just start that, that'd be fantastic. So um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeremy Potter. Um, I'm here today in my role as chair of Essex Planning Officers Association. So Essex, um, we have 15 um, councils that are involved in the Essex Planning Officers Association and there's, there's 12 districts, two unit trees and the council council. Um, so my, um, the Essex Planning Officers Association role is essentially, it brings together um, all of those councils um, and the chief officers and, and there's forums as well for things like planning policy um, and DM and enforcement and trees and I think we sort of get together we're not just um, a talking shop hopefully we actually get things done and we produce stuff as well so we commission work on behalf of all of those authorities uh, to undertake mainly evidence-based work so we do things like we've got a Essex wide gypsy and traveller um, assessment. Um, we do work on housing delivery tests and five year land supply for authorities across um, Essex um, and all sorts of other things as well that are all very interesting. Um, but I think it's it's interesting because I'm from my perspective, um, I actually work for Chelmsford City Council, so I'm the spatial planning manager there. Um, and I think Essex is probably quite a good example of somewhere which is really diverse in terms of where we are in housing delivery test terms and plan making and housing delivery across the piece really. So um, I think it's probably going to show up some of maybe of those, some of those anomalies that I think Jonathan's probably described sometimes uh, described. What I will say is that as I, I think some of you may have said, and I've got the same issue as Jonathan, if anyone knocks on my door, there we go, my Labrador's just walked in now. So um, if anyone knocks on my door, it, um, dogs will completely bark. So apologies for that. Um, I think my children are probably a bit older and a bit better behaved now than my animals, but but who knows, there could be a tantrum about um, something else, uh, shoes or um, any other bit of occasional furniture that's been brought in, I don't know. So um, I, I think also, um, I was this, listening to Shelley and Jonathan speaking about um, the past uh, as well or the, in the last sort of five or six years. And it did start making me hankering after the, all, the, all the acronyms, the UPC, the OAN, the SMPP. And it started making me thinking I, it was a, an awful time for us in about 2014 at Chelmsford where we were really getting attacked. Um, we were getting a load of speculative development and um, we decided at that point that I think probably the only way we could get through this is to just get our local plan done as quickly as possible. Um, and I think there's going to be a thread in my, in my presentation here and you're probably going to hear me say that on numerous occasions and I think probably Emma's probably going to say something relatively similar is that actually <clears throat> it shouldn't be seen as something in isolation. I mean, the, obviously the government's made it such for probably some good reasons and some maybe not so great reasons, but they've made it into a thing, but it's not, it's about planning, isn't it? It's about making sure that we get really ambitious plans that meet all of our community's needs. And that's the focus really, that's what I want to focus on rather than maybe, you know, a relatively narrow, blunt instrument, but, we are where we are and um, we need to deal deal with that. And I think what I'm going to sort of touch upon is that I'm just going to sort of just do a quick recap of the latest test, the 2020 tests, which I'm sure um, all of you are really familiar with anyway. So I'm um, not going to really do that too, too much, labour that too much. But also I think I was going to sort of touch on some practical tips. And I think Emma will have some really good practical tips as well um, about actually what you can do when you're faced with some difficult decisions. And I think when we discussed this earlier, Shelley, we were talking about maybe having to hold your nose sometimes, hold your nose um, on things that may not necessarily be perfect because you're in a situation where you, you, 
you do need to maybe be a bit broader on, on, on your decision making. But then that doesn't mean, I think it's really, really crucial, it doesn't mean that this is a presumption to grant planning permission because it's far from that at all. You know, and we hear from delegates on, on, on this call that actually, in practice, it doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is that you do need to focus a little bit more on, I suppose, and I come on to this, it's kind of harm and benefit um, and make that judgment. Because what it will come down to, and as Jonathan said, it is all about planning judgment at the end of the day. You're tipped into you're tipped into the, the vortex, as Shelley says. You're whizzing around, but you've still got to make those judgments, even though it might feel like you're getting a bit dizzy and you don't know quite what to do um, in, in, in that. In that that sort of scenario so if we could just go on to the next slide um so so just just to familiarize yourself i mean the housing i mean the housing delivery tests in my view and i should have said this right at the beginning these are my views uh, my personal views uh, rather than um city council views but um my view is that it is quite a blunt tool um and it essentially does sanction local authorities, you know, provides us quite a, quite a significant sanction to a local authority to implement its local plan or not, as the case may be. Um, but I think it can, in certain cases, work against other government priorities. So there are, you know, all of the other things like beauty, whatever that is. So I won't get into, won't, we won't get into that now, but beauty, design, zero carbon, affordable homes, self-build, biodiversity net gain, all of those things are being asked to reverse as well, of course. Um, and they tend to take a bit of time and be a bit complicated. But that isn't saying that we should be dragging our heels and not making plans and not granting planning permission. Of course we should. And I think in principle, I think to be tested, to have a plan that you put forward, spends, as many of you probably do, many years of your lives getting through a process you want you want to make sure it's deliverable don't you um and also i don't think it's unreasonable to be tested against that i don't think that's an unreasonable proposition to say that actually you've got all this strategy together you've got all of these sites and then by the way it doesn't really matter if you deliver a bit anyway um until the next time you review it review it in 10 years time or whatever the case may have been in the past so i think in principle i think it's a good idea I think my view, my view on it is that it can be a bit blunt, and well, it is blunt. Um, and this this um, shows how um, it essentially gets harder and harder. <laughs> it doesn't get any easier. Um, and if your authority that is using the standard method now as your metric, um, and that, that number has gone up significantly in high demand areas, normally that would be the case. It's even harder. Um, so you kind of like um, you're, you're whizzing around Shelley's vortex, getting dizzier and dizzier um, without really getting, you know, getting sucked into the U-bend. Um, and that's probably how some authorities will be feeling. However, if you just go on to the next, uh, next slide, um, Shelley, is it really, is that really the case? Because actually, when you look at where the, is it 55? Yeah, 55 presumption authorities are, there is a kind of a quite a clear correlation here. And I think someone, a delegate on the call was talking about Greenbelt. And I think if you put the Greenbelt over that plan, you would see a significant amount of correlation between presumption authorities authorities that are in presumption because of the housing delivery test, let's just make that um, clear, and and the green belt. Um, and I think, you know, I think it was interesting, that conversation about judgment, because I, I think, and we'll probably come on to this in a minute in terms of how you apply paragraph 11 of the MPF, but there are certain things that are a bit more binary in their judgment. Um, and there are certain things where the bar is really high. So my view is for green belts, um, if there aren't exceptional circumstances, which and the, and the bar is pretty high for those in, in the MPPF, um, and in case law and whatever, um, then actually it is, it, it, it is kind of a bit of a safety uh, blanket around those authorities to say, well, it kind of trumps, it kind of trumps most things really 
Um, and is the presumption, does it make any difference to us? Um, I think that is a question that probably some Greenbelt authorities are, are seriously thinking through as a, as a, as a concept. Um, because if you think of the, the objective of the housing delivery test is to obviously increase delivery, um, if you're in a situation where another policy kind of trumps that, then does that stop you having to make those hard decisions? I mean, I, I'll leave that just sort of hanging, but I think there is there is a definite um, a definite correlation between those those two efforts. I think there's 186 authorities in England that's um, that've got green belt, um, and I, I reckon the 55 presumption, as I say, I reckon that many of those, the vast majority of those, are one of those 186 authorities. So if we just go on to the next one, Shelley, I think the thing, um, and I think I've got my Edvard Monk, um, not to be outdone, um, it, is, it is a matter of not panicking because just because you are placed in this, the naughty step, or I've heard it called many other things, that's the, the kindest thing, kindest term, but um, just because you are, it doesn't mean that you don't, you can't apply policy, you can't apply judgment to that policy, and you can't apply um, local circumstances. I, I think all of those things are still absolutely in play. Um, it's just that it's, it needs you to um, be thinking a lot more carefully about how you apply that. And I would absolutely, uh, Jonathan's point and Shelley's point about showing you're working out is absolutely critical because that offers us a report where you're doing the planning judgment, the planning balance, actually making that final decision on the weight that you've given, um, to, you know, as an inspector would. Think about actually like reading an inspector's letter and at the end making that balance and showing how your decision has made that. Um, I think that is going to be a lot, that's really helpful if you're challenged at appeal, um, uh, providing obviously the evidence that you've got is robust uh, and uh, is using it as robust. So I think I think my message really is, um, it is don't panic, it is think about actually where we are um, and where, where you want to get to. And I think if we go on to the next one, Shelley, my, my, my take on this is that I think it needs to be really clear to the whole authority what it, what it means. And I think, um, as you've heard on the call, I think it means uh, lots of things to different people. I think people will perceive it and, um, and, and think that it actually means from the range of, um, we have to give planning permission to everything, to, oh, it doesn't really affect us because we've got all these other policies and it doesn't affect us. And I think, and there's probably a hundred bits in between the grey areas between those those two extremes. So I think it's really important that councillors and senior managers know what it actually means. So having this kind of discussion um, with with them, but it also, um, as I said, it also seems an arbitrary measure, but it also does show that other things aren't working. Um, not only are you not delivering. By not delivering, you're not delivering affordable housing for communities and authorities aren't doing that. And I'm sure most authorities, even the ones that are really, really anti, anti development, still want affordable housing. They still want infrastructure. Um, they still want, um, you know, biodiversity net gain. Um, they still want all of the other things, community facilities that comes with new development. Um, and a measure of not having development will be, um, you know, There'll be a, an act, a, a, a measure that actually shows that you're not actually delivering some of your other corporate objectives. Um, and I think it's also taking that kind of corporate ownership of the issue and setting out the actions that are needed. And the action plans tend to do that. And then we'll be talking a lot more about that. So I think that's one message that I think I wanted to make sure that we kind of um, that I got across is that it's not just about the planning department as such. It's, and as local plans aren't just about the planning department, they are about the whole council, the whole area. 
the next one, Shelley, shows saying also just be upfront about it. Um, they've been published. Everyone knows. Everyone knows who you are. Um, so I think I think it's you, you know don't shy away from it and don't make knee jerk decisions either based on that kind of judgment that we were talking about. Um, just because um, you're in that 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 kind of situation, it doesn't mean that you need to go out and grant every planning application that comes along. And likewise, it doesn't mean that you carry on as normal. There is um, an area in between that you need to find a place for yourself in between. So it is regaining um, the initiative, communicating with councillors, developers, and communities. That's important as well making sure that the decision makers know what this process is as Jonathan has really precisely set out what is what you can and what you can't do and also that there is still um, that ability for planning judgment by the decision maker and I think the other thing that I just wanted to sort of um, tack on to that is that I think um, just pick up from what Shelley was saying it's it's about getting the journey to get out of presumption because we don't really i mean presumption probably isn't isn't a good place to be for a number of different reasons but also as i said before it is indicating that probably quite a lot of the council's other objectives aren't being fulfilled as well so actually um, having a starting point to getting out of, of presumption is a, is a, is a really good is a, is a really good place to be so i just wanted to I, and I'm not going to I'm not going to go into this as um, in terms of some of the more sort of uh, legal aspects because we've 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 heard that. But if we are faced as local authorities and, and many of the local authorities that I deal with are faced with this dilemma, um, how do we actually apply what what effectively the paragraph 11 um, is saying in, in, in the MPPF? So what, what it's essentially saying is that we are going, the government is going to specify some certain sort of geographical areas, maybe, um, that we feel that actually are you know, important nationally. And because of that, um, what we want to do is to make sure that local authorities really focus um, their decision making on any harm to those, those areas. That doesn't mean that there aren't other areas that aren't specified in foot, footnote six um, of the MPPF that says that you know that you can still have a judgment about those areas. Countryside, normal countryside, it does allow you to to still make make those judgments. But I always think that the starting point is to make sure that you 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 know what the, the national policy is saying in terms of harm to um, to those particular um, areas. Um, and I mean, going through those, I mean, some of them, and I think this is this is the thing that I think you probably um, heard uh, a little bit about, is that a lot of these are quite, um, the, the bar is going to be quite, is, is, is quite high already. So, I mean, as Johnson was saying, if you're going to, if you're going to really harm a triple SI, it doesn't really matter if you're in presumption or not, you're going nowhere. Really. And if you want to put a hideous new house in an A and OB, um, 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 actually, that is a Freudian slip I've just seen on my, <laughs> on my, on my um, I think the O, o in the end around the wrong way, but uh, hopefully that isn't any reflection on me. But anyway, um, so there are sort of other things um, in relation to specific elements of the of of, of geographical areas that can be. The, that the harm could be much more attributable, much more identifiable, because you'd have um, a lot of evidence that that supports that. But then going on to benefits, so we in this weighing up, weighing up, we need to make judgments on all those harms, not just the harms that are in the MPPF, other harms that are in policies um, and strategies. And I think what was interesting also is things like you know the sustainable development test as well in terms of the preceding paragraph to um, um, the, the, the presumption elements is that and I think we, we, we got a flavour from that from a colleague who was talking about a settlement hierarchy well there may well be situations where 
even though policies are quite old, they won't be as dynamic um, in terms of changing that much from maybe they were a couple of years ago in the sense of a settlement hierarchy. It's unlikely that places are going to suddenly transform from being a tiny village into a huge town with great big lots of services and facilities. So in some ways, some of those things you can still attribute significant significant weight to. Um, and in terms of, you know, many more of these um, um, benefits that are um, that are shown on this slide, you know, affordable housing is always weighed in the balance. So if you're providing affordable, if the site is providing affordable housing, it's in a sustainable location. Obviously, it's meeting housing need, but I do see that obviously the scale of the meeting of the housing needs important. So sometimes when you're only meeting a couple of homes, you know, when you're weighing the judgment, actually the harm is outweighed by not much. It's not actually giving you an awful lot. If you're getting, you know, significant amount of homes against the significant shortfall supply, and 30 40 percent of those are affordable and you're getting planning gain from that from infrastructure there's some wider economic benefit um, you're providing choice um, it may well be some enabling development in there and actually the weight starts um weighing towards um you know a grant of a, a planning permission even though you're in a situation where ordinarily your plan would say sorry it's a binary situation you're the wrong side of a line um, you won't be able to use that kind of um, um, argument without having um, these assessments and the judgments done on what harm there is and also um, on, on that benefit as well. So just going on to the next slide, I haven't got, I've only got one slide with here with the scales. So um, I'm sure you can't get through a housing delivery or housing delivery test or any kind of planning delivery without having some scales on the slide. Um, but I mean, weighing, weighing the balance is always going to be um, the, critical, the critical element and making those judgment calls. And, you know, I suppose if you have got a significantly uh, a big gap, there is going to be a bit of nose holding. Um, there is going to be a little bit of pushback um, in terms of making decisions um, that aren't going to be not particularly popular locally. But providing um, we've gone through an objective assessment of those that harm and those benefits, and that is really articulated really well in, in a report, and the decision maker really understands the context that we're we're deciding we've just talked about then you know there are decisions that that can be made and um you know um yeah i i have seen decisions that are both being made um outside of development plans that actually provide really good development so it isn't it isn't it isn't just kind of oh it's going to be a rubbish development actually um if you think about it those land holders those people those um interests in that land and that developer I want they are having to push the bar higher because they're having to achieve something that isn't in plan. So actually, you can achieve some good development through there. But that, if we go on to the next slide, Shelley, isn't a reason not, not to um, plan make. And I think I was just sort of put this slide in as a sort of a aid memoir to myself, really, in the sense that um, going from housing getting out of presumption, getting through the housing delivery test and actually starting showing that you're delivering your plan is really important and getting plan making, getting a plan over the line is, is the most important thing to do in terms of all of this. That's that's my view. And I would say that because that's that's my background. I'm a policy planner. I think local plans, you know, are, play an absolutely critical role in in what we do as a profession and how we achieve sustainable development and all the other things that we were that, that we were talking about but i think action plans and you'll hear a little bit more about that um, in a minute action plans can should be seen as kind of in isolation from the local plan they should be seen as 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 kind of a journey towards getting some of that into into a local plan so there may well be lots of really good information that you're working on as part of your local plan that can be brought in. So, you know, 
doing your shilas or assessments of sites, your essays, all of those things that provide really good evidence in relation to some of the sites that might come forward early or might come forward at the site, do you have that ability to really sort of scrutinise some really good evidence as part of an emerging uh, emerging plan? And also can change, you know, change the way a plan actually evolves in terms of some of the recommendations that come through from that because you're really focusing on delivery, really focusing on, uh, on how you can actually achieve some of the development that's set out and achieve some of the wider objectives within a, within a plan. I had to put Chelsea, that was my only reference to Chelsea, so apologies for that. So, um, but just going finally on to um, the conclusions there. So I think really my, um, my take on this is really taking ownership of, the, of it, making it corporate, um, bringing councillors and decision makers on that journey and now DM officers as well, really un them really understanding and knowing what this, what this means. Be upfront and I, there will need to be some brave decisions made. Um, but likewise, there, need, there will be some decisions that you, you will make that no, um, we are not going to accept this. It doesn't matter if we haven't delivered one house this site is not acceptable for all sorts of different other reasons. And you should be able and prepared to, to say that was really, really important. So that's identifying and protecting what's important. Be objective, um, even though it might be something that you've been fighting for years and years and years. <laughs> and I know you were probably, I could see people probably thinking, yeah, I've fighting that site for years. It didn't get in our local plan, but actually be objective, do that balancing exercise. And just keep plan making. I think that's the that's uh, that's my final um, take on it. Is just to make sure that the plans are always going to be leading leading that process. Shelley, I don't know whether I'm um, over time or under time, but um, that's probably where what I've got to um, now. If that's okay, thanks, Shelley. No, that that that's that's great, Jeremy. Um, and I'm glad you said that kind of take take your councillors on that journey and there might be some difficult decisions um i know i know when i was a practitioner um in, in presumption we had to have a get the councillors in a room tell them what it was explain to them what how it was going to affect their decision making and and we kind of went through our call for sites and it was like a right hold our noses what's the least worst you know what can we live with what what can we not live with coming forward so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that that's a kind of approach that you're advocating. That's good. Um, right. I think in terms of timing, if we jump straight on to Emma and then we've got a kind of nice gap at the end um, to sort of hear, hear from delegates and um, sort of throw some ideas around. So, Emma, I'm going to start sharing a different screen. So bear with me. And can I have some thumbs up when you can see it? Yay! Yeah, yeah that's great, Shelley. Thank you. Um, so afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Emma Goodings. I'm Head of Planning and Economic Growth at Braintree District Council. And this is my story of our five-year supply uh, journey so far. Um, so next slide, please, Shelley. Um, just a bit of an introduction to Braintree District. So we are a, a large by area rural district in North Essex. Uh, population wise, it's about 150,000. So, so not huge. And that's split between three uh, market towns, Braintree, Halstead and Whittam, and then the remaining population in about 50 or so uh, rural villages. So, so quite a rural district. In terms of the political makeup, we are strongly conservative. We have a strong conservative majority, um, but it's worth noting that our main opposition party is currently the Green and Independent Party. So that has brought um, some challenges over the last uh, couple of years where they've been the main opposition. And we had our local plan submitted in October 2017. We were working with our partners in Colchester and Tendring on the North Essex plan. So we submitted in 2017 with three uh, garden communities in it, delivering over 40,000 houses. We're now down to one garden community in the plan, and we've got half the plan uh, very recently adopted from, from our perspective on the 
22nd of February, but we've still got the remaining parts of our plan uh, to go. So we've been in examination for quite a long time. Uh, next slide, please. So then to give you some context around the Braintree position and the five-year housing supply. So at the moment, and I'm not telling you any secrets here, this is published on our website, Braintree currently has a 3.73 year supply. So we are by no means out of the woods um, yet. And that's probably our lowest supply position for a number of years. We've, we've tended to hover between four and four and a half years for the last three or so years. So we've had a bit of a dip uh, this year. Uh, we had an issue in that our uh, 2011 core strategy, we only had to build 273 homes a year. And the target in our new local plan is almost treble that. So we have a huge uh, difference between the two, uh, the two targets, which has meant really that we didn't have any sort of pipeline of sites to work through. Um, and we were starting sort of from a blank sheet of paper. In terms of housing delivery test, we've always been an action plan authority. So this is our third year we'll be required to produce an action plan. Although I had to write it on there, we were 35 homes short in the first year of making 95% delivery, which we were quite bitter about, to be honest. So we almost made it, but, but not quite. Um, last year, we were in 20% buffer territory as well. And, and this year, we've just um, come back out of that again. We've scraped it. We were rounded up to avoid 20% buffer, which uh, was good for us. And we're back into 5% buffer and, uh, and an action plan. Next slide. So in terms of our approach, uh, Braintree isn't an authority that is a stockholder. So we don't build our own council housing and we don't have very much land in the district. So we're not an authority that can build our own way out of, uh, out of supply issues. We've, we've got to work with, with the development industry to do that. Um, so first of all, and as I think everybody has mentioned today, we needed to be really clear with our residents and with our members that we are required to consider each planning application on its merits. As others have said, it's not that we are now having to approve everything. It's where we believe that there are reasonable and justified reasons to do so. We will refuse things. Um, but equally, we will recommend things where we believe that they are sustainable development, even if they are not draft allocations within our local plan. So that was quite a difficult message early on to sort of make clear with, with residents and members. We looked at the draft allocations within our plan as being the sites that had the most, um, that were for us the, the most likely sites to be approved they are the sites that have been through sustainability appraisal they've had all the various other studies done on them as part of the local plan and they've also been before members and residents before as part of the local plan process so we worked with the developers of all those draft allocations given the time the local plan has been in i would we now say about 80 percent of the sites within the local plan or in the system so either at pre-app or, or planning or actually being built and that includes, I think, four out of the seven of our strategic sites, the other, the other two being in, in pre-app at the moment. So um, other three, sorry, being in pre-app at the moment. So we've, um, we've used those sites uh, to bring forward ahead of the local plan, which, which doesn't sit right when you think we worked all this time on a local plan and before it's been approved, we've had to approve all the planning applications, but, but that's the situation that, that we've been in. Braintree as a district has a, um, a strong construction um, base within its industry. So we have a number of house builders based in the district, but we also have a number of uh, construction companies who are involved in infrastructure and, and other parts of construction. And so we've been trying to work with the industry to help increase the speed of house building, not just for us, obviously, but, but across the board. So we're currently building an innovation in construction centre, um, which is a, a southeast local enterprise centre project, uh, along with BDC funding, which we hope will bring um, will bring businesses large and small together to increase quality and, and quantity of new build in the district. But at the same time, we're also working on, on skills and making sure that the industry has the skills it needs to build. So we've worked with our local sixth form college. We have a new uh, a STEM centre there. And we're also working on apprenticeship programmes and other skills and development programmes to make sure that <clears throat> that's an opportunity that, um, that people know is available to them to, to upskill and, and to work in the sector. 
And finally, I suspect it's a real luxury position, but I actually have an officer who works full time on monitoring and housing land supply. And I think that's really important. She knows our sites backwards, forwards, left, right, and has, has been doing the job for, for a number of years. But also, I think it shows to the development industry and to PINs that we know our sites and we know our market and we're not going to get tripped up at appeal or inquiry because uh, there's something that we don't know about one of our sites. It also provides a consistency across different planning applications and across different appeals and inquiries, again, to have that, have that person who is providing that knowledge uh, across the board. Next slide, please. So I very briefly just wanted to take you through a, a, a few of the applications that we've considered over the last uh, three years and just about some of the decision making that we've, we've had to do. So this, this first one is in Halstead. Halstead is our third largest town, a population of about 10,000. Within the local plan, we didn't allocate all that much development to the town um, because it was the smallest. So it had a, a similar small element of, uh, of facilities. It also was poorly served by public transport and it also had a higher landscape quality around the edge of the town than some of our other uh, towns. Um, this was one of a number of applications of a similar size that, that we received uh, around the town. It was policy compliant in, in all of the terms, um, apart from being outside the development boundary, and it was willing to make contributions uh, to, to the services that we needed it to. So for this one, this was one that we approved. Uh, we considered that the positives associated with it, in our view at that point, outweighed the moderate weight afforded to the conflict with our local plan policies because it was a countryside location. It's fair to say that that isn't a universally popular decision amongst the local residents um, of Halstead, but nevertheless, uh, you know, members were, were willing and able to make that decision based on the evidence and that's now been built along with a num number of other uh, similar size sites around the town. Next slide please. This next uh, one is a case where we refused the application and it was appealed and we won the appeal. So this was Brook Green near Braintree which is our, our biggest town. If it had been approved, this would have been the largest application approved for probably 20 years in the district. So it gives you an idea of the significance of, of the scale of it for us. So about 1600 houses and associated facilities. You can see on the map there that the, that is the edge of Braintree. So it is a sort of urban extension uh, to the Braintree with the A120 actually main dual carriageway uh, to the south of the site. We did have some statutory objections on this one, um, on highways, education and on sport provision. And we refused it in the end on a, on a number of grounds, including those, but also impacts on heritage, on landscape, on coalescence between Braintree and, and a village that's just off the map there, um, highways impact and biodiversity impact. This was a recovered case uh, from the Secretary of State and um, those statutory objections had been um, negotiated away during the process, but in the end, the inspector uh, on balance agreed that the harm to heritage, um, less than significant harm to heritage it was there, but landscape and coalescence uh, outweighed the benefits of the scheme and therefore we, uh, we were successful on appeal. Next slide, please. And then this is a very recent case, uh, one where we uh, refused the application and then we lost the appeal. So this is, is Finching Field. I've put a little picture of Finching Field on there just to give you a flavour for what the village looks like. It's often said to be one of the most uh, photographed villages in Essex. So a real gem of a little sort of country village, much smaller application, 50 homes, delivering policy compliant in all other circumstances, including 40% affordable, uh, no statutory objections. We refused it and we thought we had a very strong case with regards to impact on the landscape, on Finching Fields conservation area and on harm to the intrinsic beauty and character of the countryside. Um, unfortunately on that one, the inspector uh, went the other way. Uh, on, on the balance, they decided that the positives of the scheme in, in terms of the housing supply and affordable housing largely outweighed that conflict with the, uh, with the plan policies. So I suppose I've, I've just shared those three examples with you 
um, to show the narrow margins there are be between um, between winning and, and losing, as it were, on appeal or, be or between sites that you may approve and sites that you may refuse. On all those sites, you know, in the end, we didn't have any statutory um, consultee objections. We're not a green belt authority. They weren't affected by uh, AOMB or, or SSSI. There wasn't um, significant heritage harm, although in some cases there was less than substantial harm. So I think it really does show how important that balancing exercises at the end of the process you know these are the same officers and the same you know consultants using the same landscape policies and other policies in the plan and they're carefully doing that balancing act and and we absolutely as jeremy was saying and uh, and jonathan we absolutely have a section at the end of all our committee reports you know the planning balance where officers weigh up the case and then and then come to their conclusion and again we found that really helpful when we've come through uh, we've come through to appeals uh, and inquiries Next slide please so it, it's absolutely being a challenging time the last sort of three or so years um one of the main challenges has been the delay in, in the local plan process. I mean, it, it's fair to say that neither us nor PINs expected that we would be in examination three and a half years later, and we will, we will almost definitely break four years in examination before we get the final part of the plan adopted. So I think we may be going for the record, um, but, but it has been a, a huge delay and, and it is something that, that politically we get challenged on often. You know, if you, if you had the local plan in place earlier, you wouldn't have to be approving, you know, this una unallocated site in the countryside. So, so it's been a it's been difficult time. For the particular challenge for us has been around that huge gap between the previous and new housing targets, as I said, and, and not having that pipeline of, of sites to, to work through. We've also had, and I, I suspect this is common, residents and in some cases members feeling that the council isn't isn't doing enough um you know people not why can't you refuse that application why can't you ask for that massive piece of new infrastructure if you're going to approve that application you know why aren't you getting the local plan in place faster and that is hard to manage and it is just about explaining you know what we have in, within our gift and what we don't and similarly not understanding the powers that a local planning authority has some people say well, why why do you need to um consider this application at all why can't you just dismiss it out of hand if it's not a local plan allocation or or even you know why are you approving this um this conversion of this office building you know they, they don't understand the powers and, and the difficulties of the planning system and that is really that's a really hard thing to try and explain particularly to residents, particularly if you're trying to do it in response to a tweet or a social media post or within a, you know, a short piece of uh, writing on a, on a website or within a parish magazine. It's really tricky to get the, the, the nuances of the planning system across in a way that, that people can understand. And then finally, we did have um, some inconsistency in our appeal outcomes. So, so one particular uh, time 2018 we were looking at housing supply we had two inspectors considering the same evidence who came to two different conclusions on our housing supply number within a couple of months of each other and that was really difficult for us because as you can imagine the development industry took the 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 lowest approach in each of those and you know you could be argued that that the local planning authority was you know wanted to take the higher approach for each of those and it, so it really did leave us in a bit of difficulty about what you know what our housing supply position actually was and how we took that forward into the next the next appeal and the next inquiry so finally is my top tips for uh getting getting through this and i should have said actually from the beginning all of this is my own personal opinion and it's not a it's not not speaking uh with a, a brain tree district council voice but with my own with my own voice um but i would say we're really lucky at brain tree within the the members that we have and i cannot stress enough the relationship between members and officers is absolutely key to getting through this this time you know members are often the ones who are faced with um the phone calls you know the emails the in, in in previous times, you know, walking to the shop and finding that, you know, they've got residents complaining to them about about a decision or a, a site that's come in. 
and giving them the tools to be able to respond but also knowing that they have a trust within the officer advice that they're getting I think is is a huge thing and I, I would say that no no planning authority can really function the way it needs to unless it has a good set of members as well as a good a good set of officers so so training communication trust and honesty with members is absolutely key um, communication I've already mentioned communication with members but also communication with uh, with the wider public through you know all the means that you would normally commu uh, communicate with your mem with your residents on and also flexing that communication for the for the particular um, audience so we have a a, um, a local planning uh, bulletin which you know people can sign up to and we have about 1500 people signed up to that bulletin and we we take it that those are the people who are most interested in planning so we would provide more detail um about our, you know a current situation or a current issue in that than we would do um in just some general space that we were putting out on a you know a leaflet that went out of the the council tax bills and things but we do communicate with them and you know there's no point as Jeremy said in his presentation there's no point in hiding from these issues you know anybody with a brain and and, the, and Google can you know find your position and, and find where you stand so better to tell better that they hear it from you rather than uh, hearing it from anyone else. Uh, practically wise absolutely make sure that you've got a budget and resources set aside for defending appeals and inquiries you will be a target because you don't have a five year supply and you shouldn't underestimate the amount of time that each appeal and each public inquiry takes. I mean, we've had more in the last few years than than I can ever imagine. And, you know, several of them, well, a couple of them have turned into judicial reviews as well. So it's it's a huge stretch on the authority on those case officers you know it's a huge impact on their other caseload if they're involved in an appeal or an inquiry um, so don't underestimate that and also great to set aside a um, great to set aside a budget for internal and, and external uh, funding a following on from that having a really good relationship with a legal advisor or, or counsel we have two or three um, barristers who we have a really great relationship with they know us uh, we know them and they also know the district, the policies and, and previous decisions that have been made. And that is is really, really helpful, particularly if you're in the heat of an, an inquiry and, you know, you're making sort of fast decisions under pressure. That's that's a really positive to have. And then my my final point was just about resilience. We know that planning is a hugely emotive subject and we know that as planners we will get angry emails we will get angry phone calls we'll get complaints we'll get mp letters and sometimes even whole social media campaigns or or conversation correspondence trials trails which are criticizing us either personally or through the decisions that the council has made or even sometimes making you know completely unfounded accusations against officers or members or you know essentially venting in a conversation that would have happened in the pub and which you would have never have heard about five years ago people feel that they can say that on social media now and it is really hard especially for young planners or planners just starting their careers to to see that or to hear that and not let it knock their confidence but i think you need to i mean you need to everybody needs to build up that emotional resilience to to deal with that to not take it personally and to remember that that you're doing the best you can for your place in the circumstances that that you currently are operating in even if the residents might not realize that that that's what you're doing you are doing the best you can for for the place that you uh, that you're in and that's it thank you shelley thanks emma that was that was really really useful to hear from someone who's kind of living it breathing it um particularly what you were saying about that kind of resilience point and and resourcing i mean uh, yeah i've i've similar experience when i've i've worked in authorities that haven't had a five year housing land supply for a number of years and i think you you can't underestimate the volume of time and resource um i mean it was it was pretty much examination you know appeal hearing appeal hearing 
just you know month on month um very little other work happening for for those particular officers um so i can see that uh we've got something coming through on the chat for uh from dave harris from medway um saying he's got a great deal of sympathy with you because he's a, in a kind of similar position of an emerging plan having a significantly boosted um housing need number um and sharing some nervousness about how to take counsellors on that journey. Um, okay, uh, so if everyone's all right, I think for the rest of the session, we're going to run a bit of a kind of Q&A discussion for all three of our speakers um, and, and sort of open that up. And I can just see Ellen has come through. Um, to what extent, if any, is there an expectation that when granting planning permission, that should be unencumbered by conditions. Oh, that's a good one. So if you're going to grant, if you're going to hold your nose, as it were, and grant something, you know, can, can you can you laden it with 200 planning conditions to, uh, to, to sort of make it as livable with as possible? Is that is that kind of a good summary of your question, Eleanor? Feel free to come in. Um, yes, I think so. I think my um, my issue is that at, at, uh, at Gateshead, we're, it's not necessary that we're refusing applications. So we do we, we are pro development and we, we do approve things. Just they're just not being delivered for, for other reasons. Um, so it was it's really just in in the context is is the goal the granting of the planning permission or is the goal I suppose the argument could be that if we put conditions on, we have a policy in relation to um, adaptable and accessible homes meeting a certain percentage for um, building reg standards. So could could a developer argue that, I'm not sure who I'm talking to in this, in, in terms of in, in, my, in my own mind, but is the issue that we are granting permission, but the, the actual delivery then might be held up because of a requirement of the could that be something that we could fall foul of? That there's an argument that we're not actually going to deliver what we've approved because of, we get a bit carried away with conditions sometimes. I'm not sure if that's up quite. No, no, I there, there, that myself. Right? <laughs> <laughs> there is never a silly question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, certainly my the the work the work that. I've seen on people putting together housing delivery test action plans um, when they've kind of reviewed what their root causes are for under delivery. That post consent stage um, is a really important part of the delivery pipeline. So when councils have looked at what happens when the outline consent or the reserve matters consent leaves a building, they're not then paying attention to what happens in terms of are those conditions being discharged? Um, is there sufficient information coming forward? Um, or, or are those conditions kind of unachievable? Are they forming a, a barrier to that development coming forward? So yes, it's certainly something that councils are, when they look closely at why under delivery is not happening, finding that's, that's a problem occurring within their area. Jeremy. Yeah, I was just going to echo that. I think pre-commencement conditions are always developments. Developers always, you know, go on, um, always going on their hobby horses about those um, and how much that, how much information is required pre-commencement. Um, and yeah, I think that is that is a valid point in terms of you know being able to show um, the length of time between the grant of planning permission and a home being built and I, I think again in terms of that evidence and I think Johnson was referring to that in, in in his presentation having that evidence having that local evidence to show that actually and being objective that does help um, cases in relation to making sure that you're not over over promising and under delivering um, or or actually those conditions are are causing a a blockage to delivery. Um, if you talk to house builders, I think a lot of them say that that's the case, whether it is or not entirely. Um, that's up to um, that's up to that objective uh, decision making. Jonathan, do you want to kind of come in on the on on the point about is it linked to the weight those particular policies that 
then kind of the conditions relating to may or may not have in a particular balance. Well, I think so. Just going going back to Eleanor's question, um, I think what you might be struggling with is to, is if we're in a situation where we don't have a five year supply, is it more important that we grant permission for an op for a scheme that can come forward quickly and help us with our numbers, or or do we grant permission for the best planning permission that we can grant? Um, it, it's a difficult question to answer because there are lots of different things at play there. So there's, there's the clear policy imperative of, of bringing forward housing. But on the other hand, if you're looking at um, the example you give is accessible and adaptable homes. Now, there's, you know, there's a huge um, amount of pressure generally to make sure that houses are adaptable year forever homes and to make sure that houses that are built now um, and people move into them in their 30s or 40s, they're going to be, live there for the rest of their lives. So there were much broader objectives at play. The other thing I'd just sort of draw your attention to is developers are often pushed back on the basis that if you're asking us to do all these different things, we can't provide the full amount of affordable housing or off-site space or pay for kids to go to school, all that kind of stuff. But the the national policy in relation to viability is much stronger now than it ever used to be. The expectation is you do an awful lot more upfront viability testing of your local plan policies. And if you've got a recently adopted plan, you should have done that. And so paragraph 57 of the framework basically says, don't come forward and argue viability with a scheme that's otherwise compliant with the development plan, because you should have done your homework you should have realised in the, that these are all the sort of things you're going to have to deliver. So the presumption is only viable schemes come forward, and it's only not in exceptional circumstances, but it's the exception rather than the rule that a developer should come forward and say, here's a viability appraisal, we can't do adaptable homes, we can't deliver affordable housing. But you're right, and just on Jeremy's point, um, pre-commencement conditions, I think, or... There's a tendency, and I mean, this is a judgment call for local authorities, there is a tendency, frankly, to impose up nearly every single planning condition as a pre-commencement condition. Um, so I think when you're imposing conditions, think carefully about whether or not the, the whole point of a pre-commencement condition is something that really goes to the heart, heart of the scheme, like, a, you know, like, like how is it going to be drained, that sort of thing. I mean, do you really need... On an you know, details of bin storage before anything else happens. So I think it's only in those circumstances, but where where you genuinely want to know the outcome in advance, then a pre-commitment condition would be sensible. Otherwise, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily favour one, and that might help with delivery. I think also, Shelley, if I may, I think Jeremy made a good point earlier that if you are working with a developer who is not on an, on an allocated site in the local plan, they know that that site is bigger risk. And therefore, in some cases, they may be more willing to say, you know, what can I can I offer you, you know, this extra cycle way or would it, you know, would it help if you know whatever it, it may be that is a particular concern of, of your residents and obviously as long as it, it's it's necessary and appropriate for the development then they may be more willing to to look at that because it is an unallocated site and they know that they're in more sort of rocky ground in terms of permissions and um, again equally echo jeremy's point about conditions we've done our own research around time from permissions to to delivery on the ground so that we don't just rely on the uh, the Litchfield report which you know everybody quotes but actually when we did our own research we found that in many cases we were ahead of that um we were ahead of that curve and if, if you've got that for for an inspector and they they can see that then um then that again it gives you gives a good indication to the inspectorate that you know your market and you know you know that you're doing the right things or that you know you've been doing perhaps some of the wrong things and therefore you're uh, you know you're, you're looking to address that and and talking of the inspectorate um david uh smith from from the planning inspectorate has has 
has been listening the whole time and uh, is more than happy to, to kind of jump in on the discussion. Um, and I'm sure he's a great advocate of providing sort of local evidence on, on leading times and build out rates as well. So David, really keen to hear your thoughts on today's session. Thank you. Um, thank you for all the presentations, which have been very um, interesting. I I'm going to do the normal thing and sort of say at the outset, uh, these are my views. I, I don't uh, speak as a making policy for the planning inspector or for individual inspectors, uh, but my job is to is responsible for quality and training of inspectors doing appeals. So I'm the one that makes sure that all the case law that Jonathan referred to uh, is known about by inspectors and uh, uh, tell them or give them advice about how best to to apply it. Uh, really, I thought I'd jump in and say a few things to kind of endorse uh, many of the points that have been made already, because I thought that might be be helpful. Um, Emma was just talking about um, evidence, and absolutely, I mean, if you find yourself in a presumption position, then give evidence at appeal. Uh, if you're there to about the things that have been spoken about, so knowing your sites, knowing your build out rates and indicating how, how you're proposing to get out of the supply uh, situation that you're in, what steps you're taking, that will weigh in the balance for, for an inspector. Um, and just thinking about appeals as well, um, um, Emma was talking about inquiries, uh, but of course many appeals are written reps. Um, so if your local authority please give evidence to inspectors in written reps cases as well. Um, it's not lim limited to, um, uh, to, to the events. 90% um, of our appeals roughly are written reps and many of them involve smaller sites perhaps, but where there are issues of the tilted balance being applied. So, so don't forget to do, to do that, please. Um, I fully endorse all the stuff that's been said about giving reasons. So this ties in with evidence, you know, why have you reached the view that you've, you've reached? in an officer's report or appeal statement that's really is going to be helpful to an inspector um, as as planning inspector in general we like APS as well um, because that clears away one issue that we we wouldn't have to grapple with so so we're in favor of APS I'm sure there are other good reasons as well but we would support more authorities um, doing that and then um, I, I'm probably not going to I'm not going to uh, get too involved in the issue of inconsistency of decisions or comment on individual decisions that Emma highlighted. Um, but clearly, as we've been hearing all along, there is a lot of judgment involved here. And that is what an individual inspector who is an independent decision maker will be exercising. And as we've heard, there is a whole matrix of factors to take into, in, to take into account. Um, but if, as a local authority, you don't give the inspector the evidence about where you're at, where you're going, and what the situation is, then she or he can't take it into account. So, um, so judgment comes into it, but judgment is based on evidence. So give the inspector that, that evidence, and that will help you get the, the best outcome. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, I don't know if it, any of our speakers want to kind of come come in with some some feedback on that or some final thoughts. Jonathan. Yeah, no, can I just thank that's a really, really important contribution, David. Thank you very much. Can, I would like to endorse wholeheartedly David's comments about paying close attention to written reps submissions because um, it, it's I don't get involved very often in written reps appeals unless they are challenged in the courts but what strikes me sometimes is that the level of attention that's paid to a written reps appeal and you, you could have a written reps appeal i'm involved in uh, looking at one at the moment where it's 180 houses done by, you know, done by written reps um but the amount of time and effort that the council put into um explaining its case i'm sure was significantly less than had it gone to a hearing on inquiry um, and I think as a consequence, the, the outcome was less positive for the council than if they really paid attention to it and assumed it was, if you treat written reps appeal just like a, an appeal hearing and you have to assume you're going to be challenged on what you're writing, I think that's quite a good discipline to have in mind. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. So I'm just quickly going to share my screen for one last little bit 
uh, and then I promise we can all go off and have a glass of something nice and cold at the end of a Friday. Um, so this kind of leads back to the sort of key message we've all been banging on about, about showing your workings. Um, and my personal favourite place to do that is within your housing delivery action plan. So you shouldn't just be doing it based on your HGT result. It should be a kind of matter of best practice because you can draw together all of this information on what's happening with local delivery, what you're doing to get out of it, what your plans are for the future. So this is just a bit of a plug for the delegates in the room. Um, if you need to do an action plan, um, PAS have an updated guide. We updated it last summer. So it's full of up to date lessons learned and practical tips on how to put one together. We also have a counsellor's guide on monitoring and delivery. So it's a really useful tool to help walk your counsellors through some of these quite technical issues. So please use it, abuse it, steal it if you need to. And then we also have um, coming up next week, a housing delivery test action plan for first timers event. Um, now, it's not exclusive to first timers, but it is a bit of a back to basics on how to put an action plan together in terms of going through root causes, what kind of local evidence base on, on build out and lead in times you might put together and, and sort of how you interrogate your planning data, which is something we've kind of all talked about today. So if you want to come along next week and do a bit more of a deep dive into that sort of stuff, um, then the link is through Eventbrite or through our newsletter. As ever, here's our contact details. Um, so we've, I don't, actually, I don't know if anyone mans the phone anymore, but um, definitely email addresses work. Uh, we will be circulating the materials um, to, to everyone who's come today. Um, and hopefully we're also kind of going to turn this into a bit of a, vid, bit of a video resource as well for our website. And hopefully you found today useful. So I think that just leaves me to say thank you so much uh, to our speakers for giving up their valuable Friday afternoons um, and talking us through what's been a really, really informative session. So thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Emma. And thank you, David from, uh, from PINS coming along as well. I, for one, have wanted to do a, a presumption tilted balance event for a long time. Um, so this has been this has been right up my street. It's been great. I've learned so much. So thank you again for coming. It's been fantastic. So have a lovely Friday, everybody. Thank you. Have a good Friday.